Hello everybody and welcome to Alan History Nerd. This is the latest of my videos on A-level politics and today I am looking at different electoral systems. This is a, a topic which will exercise me slightly as I do have a very, very strong opinion on some of this. So I will try and be as balanced as I can, but when anybody utters the phrase first past the post, I do tend to get a little bit angry. So I will try and keep that within and I will try and give you a balanced view on all the different electoral systems. So different electoral systems, what you need to know, well, this is what the spec tells us you need to know for A-level politics. You need to know the first past the post system. You need to know additional member system. You need to know the single transferable vote system and you need to know the supplementary vote system. You need to know the advantages and disadvantages of these different systems. Again, I'm going to try and be, ba uh, be balanced. And you need to be able to compare first past the post to the different electoral systems in, a, in the devolved parliament and assemblies. So we're going to try and do uh, as much of that as we can and give you hopefully some nice solid information to take into uh, your lessons or your revision or get you ready uh, for those exams or just to build your knowledge. So we're going to start with first past the post and I can feel myself getting slightly irritated already. Right, it is a plurality system and what this means is you don't need a majority. So you just win by having one more vote than anybody else. Uh, and it's not a majority system. It's a not a proportional system. In fact, it leads to massively disproportional outcomes. It is a very widely used voting system, not only in UK general elections, but it is used very widely across the world. Uh, and in, in which the candidate who wins the most votes in that constituency or seat or area, however the, the country divides it, is elected to represent that area. And that fits into one of its key strengths is that connection between the area where the, uh, the representative comes from and the people there who voted for them. It's used in UK general elections. MPs are elected in single member constituencies. There are 650 of them. Uh, votes are cast one, uh, voters cast one vote. Uh, constituencies are supposed to be of roughly equal size uh, and the average is about 75,000. But they do vary from a constituency of the Isle of Wight, which is 110,700, to a constituency on the Western Isles, which is just over 21,000. So they've not done a very good job of equal, uh, equal size. Another thing I feel on this, and again, you may, may disagree, is 650 seems like an awful lot. Um, bear in mind, for example, in the US, in their their house they have uh, about 200 less than that uh, and even if you add the house of representatives and the senate together it's still about a hundred less than we have mps in parliament so again that's possibly a debate for a different place but it, it is 650 seems like an awful lot uh, for a country of our size and they should be equal in size, and that's in, in terms of numbers of people who live there. In, in terms of geographical size, they vary enormously, because obviously to get to about 75,000 people uh, in London, uh, you don't need a very big area, which is why sometimes uh, electoral maps can look really, really odd. Um, I remember uh, when I was first teaching and the, the, uh, the, the election, the previous last election had been the, the 1997 one and Labour won a massive landslide. But if you looked at an electoral map, it looked blue, apart from a band across the north of England, Scotland and Wales and uh, London and Birmingham. And other than that, it was all the it was blue. But that's because obviously rural constituencies are really big, whilst urban ones are really small geographically. With the first past the post system you get safe seats which are dominated by a single party uh, and marginal seats that are tightly contested. So in a safe seat you might kind of hear someone saying uh, something along the lines of uh, you could st stand a donkey and stick a red or blue rosette insert depending on where you are in the country and it would win. And there are places which have had uh, an, M an MP from a particular type, a particular party for a hundred years or more. And in a lot of these seats, then they're not very tightly contested. And we, we see, for example, some of the seats in the, in the North East, uh, Newcastle Sunderland often competes to be the first one to declare on electoral nights. And part of the reason why they can do it, they set up systems to make it get it done really, really quickly. But it's unlikely at any point to be particularly close. And therefore, 
almost the uh, you're almost weighing the votes rather than uh, rather than uh, wondering which way it's going to go. Now, parties and the media and everything seems to then closely focus on the marginal seat. So that marginal is where the, it, there is a two way fight or maybe even a three way fight to see who will win. And it's not clear which, which party will take that seat. And that tends to then get a load of resources poured into it. Lots of campaigning visits from the uh, party leaders, etc. So you see this real dis dis uh, disparity between the campaigning in a marginal than you will do in a safe seat. And this also tells us something very different about the, the, the value of, of, of people's votes. So, and it can affect uh, voter turnout. So if you live in an absolutely solid seat, then if you support the party that always wins it, you might even still not bother turning out to vote because it's not going to make any difference because they're going to win anyway. And if you don't support the party that always wins, then you're possibly even less likely to turn out and bother voting because you can go out and vote every time, but it won't make any difference. Whilst you live in a marginal, then it can be really tight and therefore your vote can make a bigger difference. And this is added on top of what we've seen above, which is that the seats aren't actually the same size in terms of population anyway. The number of marginal seats has been in steep decline. Um, there's an issue with this, for example, in America as well, with the number of states which are marginal as we go into presidential elections. But there was a noticeable shift in 2019 and there's what's known as the Red Wall, which kind of goes across uh, from the northwest of England across through the through uh, the major seas like the kind of Liverpool, Manchester, across um, Sheffield up towards uh, Leeds, Castleford, and then all, all the way over to Hull. And it's known as as the, the Red Wall, and essentially a lot of this has always been consistently Labour. And actually, what happened in 2019 is that Boris Johnson's Conservatives actually started knocking down some of this this red wall. They started to win seats that they hadn't ordinarily won. And therefore, when we get to the next election, then we might be talking about some marginal seats, which in the past had never been considered uh, marginals. So again, that's something that is developing. As I said, I'm going to try and be balanced. So I, I have done advantages as well as disadvantages. I mean, the first one is, is uh, I'm not sure how great an advantage this is, but it is an advantage. It, the, the counting is simple um, and the outcome is generally very, very clear, both in a constituency and at national level. At the end, the, the voting system is very easy to understand. So person in place X got one more vote than other person in place X and therefore they won. Um, and then you just work out, well, we, we, we need to get over half the uh, half the seats. And to do that, we form a government. It tends to lead to competition between two major parties, which tends to make it fairly straightforward. Uh, it seems to have public support. There was a, a referendum about changing uh, our, our voting system in 2011. And overwhelmingly, the vote was to, to keep it as it is. And, and the voter turnout, actually, and that was pretty low as well. It's just not this isn't a burning issue for many people. It might just be one for um, politics nerds like me. It, the, it tends to lead to stable single party government. Also, that's what all of the old textbooks say. But you will notice there was this period, uh, particularly between 2010 and 2017, where that didn't actually um, seem to be true. Uh, and uh, all the way through, obviously, till tw 2019 uh, uh, until we had the most recent election. So and again, it, it sta stable single party government. Um, again, uh, there might be another time, another place for debate on whether that is actually something you want. Um, and you might see examples in politics going forward where our, our stable single party government just decides to do something and there's nothing anybody else can do about it, even if the public doesn't necessarily um, agree. Um, there, there is clear links between representatives and constituents, and this tends to be one of the things that voters most like about First Past the Post, because you know who represents you. So if you've got a problem, you know who to go to and complain about stuff, to ask questions to, to ask to fight your corner. Um, the government is clearly accountable under first past the post because if they don't do what you want them to do, you vote for somebody else. Um, now, one of the old arguments, and, and again, this is one that irritates me as a, a as a historian as well as a, a politics uh, teacher, is it, it says, and it, it does say this in all the books and everything, so I better tell you, it says it stops extreme parties. Um, it, I suppose it probably makes them less likely, but. Uh, 
the, the example that's always given on this that I, I, I often hear goes back to uh, Weimar Germany and people go, ah, it was proportional representation um, that let in the Nazis. Well, it wasn't proportional uh, representation that in the Nazis. It was 40 percent of the German population voting for them. If there had been first past the post, well, in the UK, if you get over 40% of the uh, of the vote, pretty often, or more often than not, you end up with a massive majority. Look at our current um, our, our current situation. So, yes, it's of small parties. It really damages. Extreme parties tend to be smaller. So, if small part. If extreme parties are small, then it stops them getting members of parliament. If extreme parties are big, it, it does absolutely nothing at all. So disadvantages. You don't need a majority to win a seat. My favourite example of this is Belfast South in 2015, when the winner of the seat in Belfast South got 24.5% of the vote. This is why elections can be rather confusing. And this is one of the things that I always found rather confusing was first past the post, is you'd look at it and I'd go, the government seem enormously unpopular. Um, uh, and this has been the case when we've had part, governments of both types. They don't seem to be hugely popular, but they've got this massive majority. How did that happen? Well, that happens because of the disproportional results that are given. It favours them, uh, the big two parties. It creates this two party system. Now, some people might argue that goes on the other side of the list. But in terms of voter choice and um, and, and voter engagement, then two party systems are generally not great. It produces a winner bonus, which means that a relatively small gap between the two major parties can lead to absolute landslides. And we see this in 1983, we see it to a degree in 1997, when one party does get more more votes than the, the nearest rival, but the, the way it then works out in Parliament can be a bit nuts. Um, it votes as, it, it favours parties with concentrated voter voters. So if you are very thinly cross, spread across the country and your party keeps coming second, you can end up with very few seats. And the Liberal Democrats are are the major uh, party that has missed out on this. And in more recent times, it particularly was very damaging uh, to UKIP as well. It's always been damaging to the Green Party. Some parties do very well out of it. So 2019, then uh, the Conservatives received just under 44 percent of the vote but they won 56% of the seats. Uh, the SNP are another party uh, that uh, does massively well out of this. I mean, if you, if you look at the number of seats that they have and then the number of total votes that they've got and compare it to uh, over the last few general elections to the Liberal Democrats or to UKIP or any of the other small parties, then it, it is very confusing in terms of total number of votes. But it's down to the fact that obviously they're only competing in the Scottish, um, in, in the Scottish constituencies. Right. A different voting system is the additional member system. This is a mixed or hybrid system. It's a mixture of first past the post and proportional representation. It is used in the Scottish and Welsh parliaments and in the London Assembly. So some seats are constituency based and are elected on first past the post in single member constituencies. So 73 of the 129 seats in Scotland, for example, are done like this. The rest are elected using a regional list system in multi member constituencies. And this bit is done uh, proportionally uh, and there's a, a bit of a twist on it, but essentially that's the idea. So as a voter, I can I cast a vote for a candidate in my constituency and I vote for a party in terms of my uh, regional list. Each party will then have a regional list. Uh, it's called a closed list because the people vote for the party, not for an individual person. So if if party A has a list of six for my region, I can't go, well, I want number three, please. I, I just say I voted for that party and, and they'll get elected in the order that the party chooses to, to put them on the list. The seats are allocated on a corrective basis, and this, this is the bit where it gets slightly more complicated. Um, there, there's a, a formula known as the De Hont formula. Uh, so if a party does really well in the first past the post bit, the, part, the formula will reduce the number of seats it picks up in the regional lists. So, for example, in Wales, this tends to happen to Labour. In Scotland, this tends to happen to the SNP. If the party does very badly under the first past the post formula, uh, it then the formula then uplifts the party performance in regional lists. And this can benefit other parties, for example, the Greens. It, it also did, uh, has done this for the Conservative Party in recent elections in Scotland. I mean, the Greens then use a very interesting tactic where they don't actually um, 
stand in many of the constituencies, but encourage their voters to vote for them on the regional list. And this gives them an actual boost as well. And this is one of the examples of parties or individuals working out how to play the systems. Um, the formula then is the total party votes divided by the number of seats it has. Um, and then th that is th that is added um, to one. Uh, one is added to that. The first seat goes to the party with the largest number. After that, uh, the seat is allocated and the calculation is done again. So you, that party's gained a seat. And you just go through a series of times doing that until all the seats are allocated. So this should be quite um, proportional. Uh, and it, it, we've got one side of the system trying to, um, to balance out the other. So advantages and disadvantages of this system. Well, the argument is that this gets the best of both worlds. Um, I can almost hear Hannah Montana bursting in at any moment on that one, which is probably a joke that's too old for some of you. But it's a balance of the uh, of both worlds in a way because we've got the first past the post system, which is, gives our link to constituencies, uh, and then we've got some real proportionality through the through the list system. Voters have lots of choice, so a, a voter might uh, vote for more than one party. Uh, so they can split their vote. So they might go, well, I like that candidate in my constituency who is in party A. But actually, what I really want to see as well, I want, I want to see some representation of party B. So a good example of this might be is, is you might think, well, in the constituency, I'm going to vote either um, SNP or Labour because they've got a good chance of winning. Now, I really like the Greens, but the Greens aren't going to win my constituency seat. So I will vote Green on the regional list. And therefore, I've got a chance that, that I've, I've had a preference on my constituency in the way that that goes, but also the way that I might want to vote nationally. I've done that on the regional list. So it's called split, ticking, split, split ticket voting. It's a really popular thing to do in America where they will you often have someone vote for one uh, a president of one party and then a, re, a regional uh, a member of the House of Representatives from another and they, they like the balance. We seem to want uh, all the power concentrated in the hands of one party at a time, but that isn't the only way you can do things. So a balance can be can be good. Um, we, we see something which is called zipping and this leads to improved female representation. And what some parties have done is they've alternated female or male female on their, their party lists to increase the number of um, female uh, representatives. Disadvantages then is, is, well, we get two standards or two, two different types of representative. And this kind of gives an idea of inequality within it, particularly uh, as one group has constituency duties whilst the other doesn't. It can be said to give parties too much control because they control who's on the list and what order they're on the list. Small parties tend to struggle because there's few representatives in each region. Uh, and if you get an equal split uh, between small parties, then that can reduce their, their, their representation. This has particularly been a problem in Wales, where the regions are actually possibly a bit too small. There's too few members going through, and that tends to lead to slightly less proportional outcomes in Wales than, for example, in Scotland. Another voting system used in the UK is the Single Transferable Vote, or STV. Uh, this is a proportional voting system. It, it's used in Northern Ireland uh, for its assembly for local government and European parliaments. This is in part due to the kind of unique circumstances in Northern Ireland where much of the voting is done on sectional grounds. And so people from one part or oh, one community in Northern Ireland are unlikely to want to be represented by someone from the other and vice versa. It is also used in Scottish local elections. So you have multi-member constituencies and the idea here, here in Northern Ireland, for example, is that the, both uh, the major communities can be represented. Uh, voting is in order of preference. Uh, voters can vote for as many or as few candidates as they like. And then there's another calculation used. This one's called the Droop Quota. And it calculates the number of votes a candidate needs, which is the total of, va of valid votes, um, divided by the seats available plus one. And then that's all in brackets. And you add one to that. Uh, the lowest place candidate is eliminated and second uh, preferences are transferred. Also, any excess votes for the first, the, the first and then the second and then the third uh, person who is elected are also redistributed to the second, third preferences as you go down. So in that, the essentially your vote has a, a better chance of counting and making a difference. And it should, it should mean that the 
the vote ultimately is proportional in that in that region to the different communities. So the advantage is we get proportional outcome. Um, the government ultimately is likely to be made up of parties who make up more than 50% of the vote, which is something that doesn't happen under the first past the post system. It gives um, people greater choice and they can vote for multiple parties or they can vote uh, many times essentially for the same party if they're particularly keen on that. So we've got a, a greater kind of reason for people to participate. It does lead to weaker links between representatives and constituencies. It does lead to coalition government. Now, in, in the particular example of Northern Ireland, the, these coalition governments have proved to be very uh, unstable and have frequently collapsed. And so, again, for those who want to uh, who dislike the idea of coalition government, then this is an example people can, can point to. It, it can give small parties undue power because if they en end up holding the balance and um, to form a coalition, uh, then major parties need to get them on board, then they can wield more power than their votes should suggest they should. Um, and counting the votes is complex and slow, and the results are not particularly easy to understand unless you really, really like the intricacies of voting systems and get very excited by it all, which of course I'm sure you all do. Right, another system we've got is the Supplementary Vote System, or SV. Um, this is a majoritarian vote system, so essentially you, whoever wins should end up with more than 50% of the vote. It's used to elect the Mayor of London and Police and Crime Commissioners. It it's, it's kind of works best in that kind of situation where you're looking to elect a person. Um, again, would be maybe a, a potential uh, system to use to elect a president in America, for example, or if we had a directly elected prime minister. So the voter records first and second preferences. They can choose to just do one if they if they prefer. They're not forced to do a second. If no candidate wins a majority on first preference, then all but the top two candidates are eliminated, and the second preferences of those who have, uh, have been who voted for eliminated, eliminated candidates are redistributed and added to the remaining total of the final two. So therefore, um, they should end up with a majority. Now, this can be seen to be much better than first past the post because you need a much broader base of support. So you actually need a, a majority to have shown some kind of preference for you. Um, the, the vote can be a vote for a voter can vote for a minority party, but still help to choo choose between the big two. So it might encourage more people to vote for the minor parties. Uh, and and then still not and not feel like they're throwing a vote away because they've still got that opportunity to go. Well, I'm voting for this party, but out of the big two who were likely to win, I would rather it was that one than that one. Uh, and that gives a kind of a greater power and a greater choice um, to voters. Disadvantage is not is not directly proportional. Uh, it tends to lead to uh, the least unpopular winning rather than necessarily the most popular. You don't necessarily require a majority of support on first votes uh, that, and, and ultimately, actually. And, and the voter who votes for two minor parties is, is essentially still going to have um, no impact. So if you vote for the person who comes fifth and the person who came fourth, then your vote's still not going to count in making a difference between number one and number two. In conclusion, currently in the UK, general elections use the first past the post system. And if you look at the statistics, the, the general elections have the highest voter turnout. Now, some would claim that would suggest that um, the first past the post has the greater voter engagement. I, I would counter that and say, well, general elections are the most important elections and therefore are the ones that people are most likely to turn out and vote for. And that's why it has a vote, higher voter turnout than the other elections. First past the post also gives the most disproportional outcome in, in recent elections. Vote. It's over 20% deviation from the mean compared to 11% uh, in Scotland, 15% in Wales, both of whom use AMS, and 7% in Northern Ireland which uses STV. Now, first past the post is the most likely system to give single party government, though the old argument that it always does has, has been kind of debunked by uh, some of the recent elections. Now, the general the general consensus on this, though you may or may not agree with it, is that that's a good thing to have single party government. Um, the argument then goes back to proportionality and go, well, if the majority of the people don't want that party to be in power, <coughs> celebrating an electoral system for putting them in power 
to me seems a little bit odd. Of course, other opinions are available, and a lot of people say, well, we want strong single party government. It means everything's nice and clear and things get done. And it's clear that that party did it, and so they can't blame their coalition part par uh, partners, etc. But if only 40% of the people want that party in power to give it, an, to give it a strong majority, it seems to me a little odd. Parties such as the Liberal Democrats, uh, UKIP and the Greens have all suffered under first past the post and, and uh, received nowhere near the level of representation that their votes um, would seemingly uh, demand. Uh, the Conservative Party and the SNP have both benefited um, uh, from this system over recent years and, and the impact on Labour has been um, not largely negligible one way or the other, actually. But in, in terms of the big winners have been the Conservatives and the SNP and the big losers have been the Lib Dems, UKIP and the Greens. Now, there are different things that happen with the different systems. So in first past the post, for example, you get lots of tactical voting where you kind of, people go, well, I don't like this party. I like that party. But there's no point in me voting for that party because they've got no chance. I really, really, really dislike that party. So who's the best person for me to vote with to stop them winning my seat? And you'll, there's lots of websites and things spring up on this. And they, you, you type in, right, I live in this constituency. I want to stop party X. Who do I vote for? And they go, well, actually, the best party to, to defeat them or the best way of ensuring a party other than them wins the seat is to vote this way. And so people got used to first past the post and using tactical voting in that way. And that has benefited in the past parties like the Liberal Democrats. And parties can also develop ways of, of playing the different systems. I mentioned one of these earlier where, where the Greens kind of look, have looked at it and go, well, actually, if we don't put as many constituency MPs up when we, we're using the system in Scotland, then we're more likely to benefit from the regional list system. So none of these systems are perfect in any way. And I think one of the problems that we've had in the UK is, is most people would accept to some degree that first past the post has its problems. The difficulty is, is that all the other systems do too. So there isn't an outstanding one that you can look at and go, actually, that works perfectly in all different ways. And so what you've got to think of when you're analysing this is, is what matters? Does proportionality matter? Uh, do you want a multi-party system or are you happy with a two-party system? Do you want single party government? And do you, how simple to understand do you need the voting system um, to be? How important is voter choice? Uh, and a lot of these things are not straightforward to answer. So it's an important thing for you to make up on your own mind. Right. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you've liked this video. If you have, please hit the like uh, button. If you've got any questions or queries or want to come back to me with, uh, about any of the stuff I've said, then please add something in the comments. If you haven't done so already, then please subscribe. So my my um, channel is building as much stuff on different history topics, but also on A-level politics that we possibly can. My aim is to cover eventually the whole A-level politics spec. This is a step in that direction. Please hit subscribe to get notifications as I get closer and closer to that goal, and hopefully it'll help you with your studies. Thank you very much for watching.